Good afternoon, and thank you for attending again the uh, webinar, so, uh, a series of webinars. Today we have the webinar of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group that is conduct, uh, led by, by Laura Solce. Thank you, Laura, for organizing uh, this webinar. And if you want, you can introduce our speaker today. Of course, and uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm very excited. This is the first webinar of our group, uh, and uh, I cannot think of a better way to start this. Yeah. Uh, because uh, today we will have Marisol Soingas, uh, one of the people that I consider a scientific reference here in Spain. And uh, Marisol is also an inspirational woman for uh, scientists and entrepreneurs. And today she will share with us uh, uh, her experience, uh, both as a scientist and uh, uh, in entrepreneurship. So Marisol, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. We are really looking forward to listening to you today. Thank you. Okay, so Laura, thank you very much. It's very exciting to be kind of the first speaker of a series that I'm sure is going to be very successful. And, and indeed, I hope that it will be more people getting into translational research and into, well, uh, moving uh, with, uh, it was the title of my talk, Moving uh, Science Beyond the Event. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me see if okay. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. Let me see. Now you should see it, okay, right? It is a slideshow, yes. And in the pointer. So, yes, so what I thought is to, um, to share with you kind of uh, a journey uh, that you will see it was actually quite over 10 years of a journey from uh, the discovery of a compound that we found it induced a particular form of cell death in melanoma, but I will show you that this uh, compound uh, indeed is now being tested or the derivative of this compound being tested in other uh, tumor types. Just as a disclosure, my conflict of interest, so I'm the co-founder and shareholder of a company I'm going to tell you about, Biontech Therapeutics, that now is uh, Highlight uh, Therapeutics. So first of all, so the, the, the road to translational research is, is definitely not a single one. And probably as you hear more people and as you get more um, I mean, perspectives of, of uh, scientists that try to get into companies, you will see that everyone has a story or perhaps a different story. And there are people that have very clear from the beginning uh, what they're gonna do and uh, really start research with that perspective of getting into a, a company. Others, well, we find it in the way, we have to do many turns. And for some people, well, it's true that uh, uh, it might not work. Uh, and this, we have to accept that uh, many of these uh, enterprises may not succeed. But still, I think um, that it's, uh, I would say, uh, worth uh, trying, but worth trying with the right team. And I will get into this. But again, so each of us, we will have a slightly different story to tell. And, but probably, and I, I'm sure like probably Laura will uh, agree with me. She has also started a very successful uh, company. So many times you will feel like this is kind of, you know, hanging in there and, and in part because we, we really don't have, or at least I didn't have uh, a good background on, on really what it is to, to get into a company. But uh, yes, so I, I think many people will feel uh, like this, uh, at least at some point during the development of a company. So, oh, I'm not sure why. Hold on. I have a problem and now I'm not getting the... Ah, okay. So it's, uh, okay. So the, the joke I wanted to make here, but you can see, uh, in my case, the really the, the, the road to get into uh, translational research into this company, Beyond the Tech Therapy, was really unexpected. I can tell you that I never thought that I would be in this position. And, and really that's, uh, in fact, uh, uh, mind changing, at least for me, opened the, the door to um, many possibilities. Are you seeing the pointer, by the way? Yes, yes. Okay. 
I'm not sure what's happening, but I don't get. I'm going to have to start again because I cannot move. So sorry. This was working before. No problem. It's the direct, you know. Mm, maybe, maybe a different way I should share. Okay, because if it's, everyone is going to take so slow, we're going to be horrible. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so the, the journey I'm going to tell you is about 10 years. I'm going to tell you, so data from my group starting in 2008. Then uh, how we started indeed the, the company around 2010. Mm -hmm. Then so um, the experience and, and how we moved from the lab to a really more professionalized uh, team. Then uh, the clinical trials and now this company well through several rounds of uh, adding our investors. So now it's a highlight therapeutics and, and the clinical trials that they have ongoing. But really, I'm going to focus particularly in what um, in my role was at the beginning, which may be the situation that many of you might have in terms of thinking about starting a, a company. So there are different ways, um, I guess, how do you get into a company? On, on the one hand, uh, there might be a problem uh, that you uh, addressing and in our case was the un un unmet need in the context of melanoma. From there you can get a solution, in our case was a compound and then um, an application. But this is not necessarily have to be the case, so there are sometimes uh, you might have on the other hand a pathway that you identify that you think might be important or a compound that, that those of you that may be in drug uh, development and then having a compound, you might think, okay, what would be the best way to, to develop and to exploit these compounds of any indication and then an application from there in terms of therapy. In our case, our strategy was uh, the first one. So was uh, melanoma and then how we could treat it and then the, the compound. So just getting into um, very briefly, so melanoma or my group in general. So we work on alterations of melanocytes and these are cells, I'll point them here. And they are in the basal layer of the epidermis. You know that the skin has two main layers. So the upper part is the epidermis, the, the bottom part, the dermis. And the melanocytes are usually seeing cells that are in the normal skin. So like a single one interdispersed uh, with keratinocytes that are these cells in the epidermis. Well, we all have alterations of melanocytes and these are nevi, moles, lunares in Spanish. And these we see them because they are groups of cells uh, that start dividing at some point, but then they stop. And it's good that they stop because then is when they become uh, benign. Then melanoma is the uh, dark side of this, this situation where these melanocytes continue dividing and uh, they acquire many mutations. Indeed, uh, melanoma is the tumor with the highest tumor type with the highest rate of mutations described. And then uh, these cells now have the potential to invade the epidermis, the dermis, and from there metastasizing. Well, there are different types of nevi, different types of melanomas, and my group are studying mechanistically how do these two lesions start, how they differentiate, how uh, we can, um, uh, so what are the genes involved, and, and with that information, develop better treatments. But in terms of, of now getting into uh, translational research, so there is a consideration, of course, when, when you start uh, a company, and um, this could be from melanoma, but you might think other uh, times. The other thing was the need. The need still stays, okay? Even though we, we started thinking uh, about um, getting a company uh, like almost over 10 years ago. So one, because a very frequent uh, tumor type with this, with the incidences increasing uh, really over the years. Then another point, and that's why uh, my group and others, but my group in particular, so we decided to, to study, uh, to, um, to try to identify new treatments, is because as I mentioned, it's a tumor type with a high metastatic potential. 
and, and really this is rather unique in melanomas, the, the prognosis are measured in millimeters, actually in points of millimeters. The other uh, consideration when we started is was that at that time, this was a tumor that it was extremely resistant to chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and immunotherapy. Now uh, the situation has changed and um, there are many compounds that have been developed and approved uh, in this time, but still, there is a need uh, for better treatments because tra responses are either transient or incomplete. And the other point, of course, for those of you that, I mean, when you think about a company, consideration is um, uh, revenues, uh, return, and, and um, so companies want to make money. The potential market is uh, market is uh, high uh, in melanoma, and then this uh, with this we have to add other tumor types. Indeed, that you will see that this uh, the compound that we developed uh, could have applications for. Now. Talking about uh, therapy and, and um, in general and considerations for, for company, you have to think is that, uh, and I will show you later, so it, it takes time. It takes time from the moment you get to the concept, the compound, and then the, um, the treatments. So you have to be ready for things, um, for, for advances happening in the meantime. Imanonoma is very curious because this tumor type I put here is like a, a slide that is um, so it's a big bind. It's almost like an explosion. So the, the, the tumor was, so the Egyptians knew already about melanoma as a dark tumor, a very aggressive tumor. But really uh, most of the, the advances in terms of treatment have happened in the last, uh, I would say decade. A breakthrough in the field was in 2002 with the discovery of a very frequent uh, mutation in this disease of uh, mutations in the BRAF oncogene. That led, um, so paved the way for targeted therapy, a lot of inhibitors, and uh, also in the meantime was the development of immune therapy. I'm not going to get into detail, but it's just to, to tell you what happened from the moment we started thinking of the company that was here, this uh, dashed line that you see here. So the, the initial, um, when we started, so the, the treatment, I would say the standard of care for metastatic melanoma was an alkylating agent, a carbazin, and response rates were about 15% at most. Uh, most patients would die within a year or so after diagnosis and metastasis. And then um, there were some treatments with uh, interferon, interleukins, not very effective. And as I said, mutations in BRAF discovered in a high percentage of patients. And so then from them was like really, um, I would say in, in uh, therapy, a uh, big race for uh, various inhibitors you have here. The, the arrows um, um, points or years where new treatments were approved by the FDA, so mm -hmm. the Federal um, Drug Administration in the US and also in Europe. So a lot of um, um, th discoveries in terms of targeted therapy. And there was also discovery in uh, the context of immune uh, modulation. Uh, the discovery of immune checkpoint blockers, so antibodies in particular, that kind of unleashed the uh, potential for immune um, uh, attack and immune modulation. So this is the situation where we are right now. So as I mentioned, so we started around here. So see all that has happened uh, during this time. So really what I would say that um, when you think about a company and you think about a compound, you have to be very sure that you have something either unique or either very potent or with a, a different angle because there will be delays, <laughs> not one or two, there are many delays on the way. And you might have to, to reorient and you may have to readapt because um, you may not be fast enough. Fortunately, I think we have learned and, and um, so the teams now at different institutions are much more professionalized and, and they're ready and uh, I think to speed uh, processes, but still it will always take longer, I think, than we do expect it. Um, and this is uh, where we are right now. So I mentioned that in the context of melanomas, we have targeted therapies and immune therapies, but uh, the targeted therapy are transient because melanomas accumulate many mutations and many mechanisms of resistance. The context of immune therapy, um, so the responses there are like 
60, 70% is a lot of patients are responding to, to immune checkpoint blockers. Still, the responses are not complete and with uh, side effects. So there's still a need for, for new therapies. So um, this is our case, but I would think it would be applicable to, to many of you that might be thinking about drug development. Of course, you want a compound, an antibody, an agent that is effective. So of course that would kill um, cells that are resistant to other therapies and kill in a kind of much more efficient way. Of course, uh, selectivity, this is key and uh, more so now because, I mean, since there are other compounds in there, so we have to be much more effective. And in our case, I, although I have it here like a small circle, what drove the story how we started is because we were looking for uh, compounds with a new mode of action. And, and the new mode of action, so uh, when we started, so there was a lot of, um, we had, we and others have been studying programmed cell death apoptosis, we had interfered with uh, programs of uh, cell proliferation, but at that time we were looking for a process of um, cell degradation or autophagy. And autophagy is quite curious because it's a process that is present in many cell types and normal in tumor cells to clean um, organelles or damaged or damaged organelles or, or uh, to, yes, in, in general, to remove large proteins or protein aggregates. But you can also push, or we had the idea of push, pushing autophagy to a point that the cell will kind of self-degrade and self-collapse. And so this is how we started with this idea also because I had a postdoc and I will show you now, uh, Damia Tormo. So he had uh, worked in the University of uh, Bonn in, in uh, compounds that were having, well, uh, very active anti-tumoral agents. I was at the University of Michigan at the time. So I started my, my laboratory there in a very large uh, melanoma clinic. And um, then we finished in uh, the CNIO. But when we ended up is with this picture, I will show you now it's a cell that has lots of vesicles and that's where autophagy is happening. The, the starting point uh, was when we were imaging and we did a screening for compounds that were activating the vesicular trafficking. And at the time we were interested in a protein, it's called RAP7, it's a small GTPase you have here, it's important for uh, endo, um, uh, lysosomal formation. So what I'm going to show you the videos, hopefully they run. I might have to get out of this. So there are supposed to be videos. I think you have to click escape first, otherwise uh, click escape on your uh, keyboard. I have to get out of here. And now you have you can do that. But now you're seeing the whole screen. Well, I'm not so sure what you're seeing. Are you seeing a video? Yes, we are. Um, oh, yeah, you okay. can put back in slideshow, but not with the pointer activated. That's the problem. Oh, okay, here. Yeah. Yes, I think it's a pointer where messes yeah. up. Yes. And so this is um so one video that you can see in the, in the left, nothing much happening, but in the right, so you see now lots of vesicles uh, mm -hmm. appearing, okay? So this is how the cell was, was forming uh, these vesicles and, and collapsing. And uh, this is another video here, we are imaging in green, so the, the vesicles and uh, in red, the lysosomes, and, and what you see is a lot of, so basically, um, lysosomes getting inside these vesicles, the lysosomes were degrading the organelles that the cells have, and, and ultimately the, the tumor cells were uh, collapsing. Mm -hmm. And they were, this was selective, it happened in tumor cells because they have a high ability to incorporate this compound. I'm going to show you what the compound is, okay? But the point is that we started uh, looking at a form of uh, cell death that um, uh, was uh, at the time uh, different. And, um, and then, so the point was at the time, a uh, decision on whether we were publishing or patenting, okay? 
And uh, what we decided is to go both in parallel. Of course, you pattern first <laughs> before you you uh, publish. But actually, we were we started the patent when we decided already to to start uh, thinking about uh, the next uh, step. And uh, what did we we patent, and why did we patent, um, and what did we patent? So we patented um, a long double-stranded RNA. And what it was, is was a synthetic um, a molecule, is polyinacetic polycetylic acid. And uh, so this uh, RNA had been used, this is a classical immune modulator and had been used in the clinic. And indeed it had a patent, but the patent had already expired, okay? So what was different than what allows us or like we pursued as, as a compound was the, the way we packed it. And we packed it with a carrier that in the end allowed this form of cell collapse. And, and patenting here was not simple, as I mentioned, because the, one of the components, the policy had already been patented. The carrier was already known as well. So what we had to do to come, uh, so there was a lot of work to, to do to convince the patent agent is, uh, agencies is that then, um, so the one plus one was not two, was actually uh, another uh, entity. And this is important when you think about innovation. Innovation means something that uh, you cannot predict from the literature and that has uh, a value, okay? So the way this was packed and the way, um, so what we described in terms of the mode of action was not obvious. And this was what allowed the, the, the or basically what we had the, the patent. Here, just for those that are interested, it's electron microscopy. So the, the compound, we call it VO110. 110. 110 is 100, around 100 nanometers uh, complexes that are formed, so they are nanoplexes. And then the VO is because of the company and we showed the Biomcotech. Then uh, we demonstrated that uh, the selectivity was in part because the end uptake tumor cells are much more avid. So they have macropinocytosis, they internalized the particles. Then we described the signaling cascades, the sensors involved, and then the mode of death uh, that involved, as I mentioned, vesicles with uh, lysosomes inside to end up uh, having apoptotic spaces and cell collapse. And as I mentioned, the name was uh, this Biomcotech Therapeutics. Now, also important, and, and it became important when we went into the filing of the, the, the clinical dossier was the mode of action. So that's why we had to, to demonstrate very well how was the, the action and the difference in, in how the normal and tumor cells will react to the compound. Also, and I'm not sure if you're gonna see here, so I might have to get out again. So maybe if I stop the... Well, sorry, I'm not... So what also was important is to demonstrate that we had um, the ability to verse this. Uh, what you see here is animals and red. There are lots of uh, melanomas and the melanoma is the primary tumor, then the metastasis. And it was a very good uh, efficacy with the, the compound and uh, controlling uh, tumor growth. This was in melanomas and uh, the time we were also uh, testing different uh, cell types and different um, uh, tumor types indeed. And, and that's why we started thinking about the possibility of a company. And um, so I'll move forward, sorry. And now the, the story was uh, in terms of um, not only the action that we had on in uh, autophagy and in, in the form of cell death um, by apoptosis, but also um, that the fact that we had activation of the immune system. So with all of these, we started thinking about a patent, okay? And, and then I, I have this uh, kind of uh, um, cartoon here with this question uh, because this was to me 
kind of uh, like a new field uh, probably for many of you. There are many considerations, of course, that you have to take into account. First, whether your compound is patentable or not. Patentable meaning that you have freedom, freedom to operate, uh, whether you infringe all the patents or not. And for this, it's quite important to in, uh, take um, advantage of your tech transfer office. When we started, now this you know, has a very professional office. At the time, we had to do a lot of uh, work ourselves. And for us, it was very important. And I think I will still, of course, recommend that you get a, a specialized uh, patents office. And um, we learned a lot. And the stronger your patent is, the better you will be because uh, later on you will have to find the patent uh, internationally in many countries so uh, the, the, having a very strong patent is quite important. Now then the decision. The decision once we have the patent and this is a decision that you will find um, uh, I think probably in your case as well is, is what to do. And there is one option of course the easiest I would say and, and probably the one that most people will follow is to license the, the, the patent to pharma, to biotech, and have uh, some kind of agreement where you would get revenues. Um, and and uh, so that um, is the possibility. At the time, uh, we didn't think that because we, we contacted several companies and what they wanted is already uh, to have a clinical trial almost. So um, we thought, okay, there are other options and this is spin-offs. That's also very frequent. I would say the second most frequent and um, probably uh, I believe uh, uh, so Laura and, and then many other people that you have a spin of meaning that is the, the your center, um, the, the scientific uh, research center that you are participates in the company and then is incubated somehow inside at least during a time. In our case, and at the time that now uh, it would be the way probably to go in the, the CNIO at the time. So the and the, the lawyers and the second, I mean the the abogado del estado, so the lawyers of the state, they thought there was a liability. We were too much of a liability for the CNIO, so they recommended us to start a site, so get a startup. And that's the difference. So it started up meaning that what we had is an exclusive license of the patent uh, of the, uh, the IP, so the intellectual property, then the patent, we have our contract, um, but it's a startup. And, and from the beginning, we and this was very important to separate the lab from the company. And indeed, I was uh, from a begin at the beginning. I was beginning. I was very involved, and I will show you in uh, grant writing and and the first contacts with investors. But early, early on, we separated the company from the lab, and that avoided a lot of conflict of interest. And indeed, for then subsequent rounds of uh, investment, it was easy because the then uh, the new investors only had to deal with the company and not with our center because we had a separate uh, company, okay? And this is what uh, we have here. Before we got into this, in our case, we had at the time, now you have different options, but at the time there were kind of um, public funding and, and uh, different strategies to valor, to somehow get a valorization to, to place your uh, intellectual property in the context of the field. And that uh, is what we, we started and that we thought that it was, uh, there was room, there was room for a new compound. Another important decision, um, and this is not trivial, okay? And, and here as well, I think there are different strategies. The question is, um, so for scientists, uh, that in academia, should we stay or should we go, like the song? Um, and, and then um, the, the, in my case, so what we decided, 
and I mentioned the person that uh, started the company, the, the idea of was the first author of the paper. He was really the entrepreneur and he was really the one pushing um, for the, the patent. So I said, I support you, but I think I'm going to be better off in academia because I can help from here. I can help with defining the mode of action of the compound, uh, finding alternatives and understanding better different forms of cell death. He, on the other hand, so went into, um, and I will show you, a uh, master MBA in uh, business, uh, the Instituto Empresa, very prestigious. And indeed at the Instituto Empresa, I will show you is where we started the, the business plan. But this was our path, okay? So having one person in academia, one person in the company and uh, separate, trying to, to separate. Um, and, and it was very important, I think, um, something that you have to, at least it was my, my uh, lesson in there, to, to trust and, and to delegate. Because as scientists, we are very busy. So really starting a company takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So in my case, he was the one to just really um, move the most of the, the, what it had to be done in terms of um, talking and, and finding new investors. I'm showing you here the, the picture, and this is a picture that has a lot of uh, sentimental value is when we the, the, the sign in the, the contract, the company, and then so the agreement at the CNIO when we licensed uh, the patent and exclusivity. Then um, there are considerations where you have the, the, the startup company, and, and I didn't think about this at the time, but they are important. And the the investors are going to pick, so when, when you have um, kind of an evaluation of, of, your, of the due diligence, that's how this is called. So they're going to look at the detail, everything. And so um, by me being separated uh, so from the company, that helped uh, a lot because there are things that you need to think about. And, and I put here because... Uh, I thought I needed a little bit of legal advice and, and I got this at the beginning. So because one thing is, so you start with one compound, okay. So but what about the future? What about future um, derivatives of the compounds? Uh, the compounds are yours or are compounds of the company? And this is something that uh, each person will negotiate in a different way. So something we have to take them. Of course, the confidentiality of conflict of interest because um, I should not be competing with the company, okay? So if company was the, um, and, and this is like, of course, it's very logical. So the company is developing a compound. So we, and from the lab, we have to be careful not to compete with ourselves and, and also not scoop ourselves in, in all this uh, circle. So this was interesting. And then of course you have to negotiate royalties um, for, the, for your institute and that's not trivial uh, at all. So again, so you have legal support. Uh, this was something that I would uh, recommend that this was my case. We can talk about this more. Now, then the business plan. The business plan to me, the, the business plan, if you look now that I know about it, this is like worse than uh, getting into, but worse not, but it's as complicated as a super high impact factor journal because you have to have a lot of things into consideration of the data that you have, what you're going to have, and then uh, so the, the background, I would say. And it's um, a very complex and also has to be very well, um, I would say, assembled because a poor business plan uh, would mean that you don't get uh, the investor. So again, I think this is, you have to have legal advice and ex expert advice in this context. One thing I showed this, this is not that important, but this is a typical um, graph that you have of kind of milestones. You get one milestone and then you get another milestone and then you got another milestone and then your company values more and more and more. And, and one thing, uh, so I think when we going back, so we were like really enthusiastic and, and really I think what the investors like and, and they're looking for, for a team and I will get into the concept of a team. Of course, you have to be enthusiastic because there's so many problems that you're gonna find that uh, if you don't have an enthusiastic and optimistic team, I think this will not work. In our case, we had a plan that if this was our initial, but in five years, we will go like exit the strategy, we'll have seven million, I don't know, like super interesting. And I tell you, it took longer. Of 
of course, the values now are also a different scale, but uh, I can tell you that the different milestones were not definitely uh, like this. And again, I show you these delays and many delays, but that's why you need to have a good team. And, and the team is super important. So from moment, the moment one, so I think almost from the first investor group that we, we started talking to, the first question was, what is the team? And, and they say that because we are scientists and, and as scientists, of course, they know that we don't know, or at least most of us, uh, we don't know what it is to, to get a company and you have no idea what, how complicated is market analysis or how complicated it is even to get into penetrate into the, um, uh, the drug administrations and so on. So the team, and I have here train yourself or delegate or uh, fine. in my case, I decided to delegate. This is what's done because uh, there were like suddenly words like vesting provision, buyout, uh, uh, drug alone, tag alone, uh, capitalization tables. There were a lot of vocabulary that uh, Laura is laughing because I, I, now she you know, of course, if you have a company, you have to manage this and, and you have to know and, and you have to, to, to see how you're gonna proceed. Um, the, only, the thing I knew, dilution, this is dilution is something that happens when you start and then your company, they, we were two, and then you get diluted as people, uh, investors come in and you don't get diluted proportional, you're going to get diluted <laughs> uh, depending on how much the, the, the company or the, the investors in, invest and also demand. But um, the, the thing again was to, uh, for me to, to um, just trust. And, and this is not uh, simple, um, but in our case, I was very lucky. And, and Damiato, told me that person I told you, he was doing a, a, sort of a business master's in, in the business school. So he was very smart because one of the, the basically, um, so things that are so requirements that they had was to, to just um, create or, or, or organize or assemble a business plan. And what he did is to organize and to assemble our business plan. And so it was very professional, the best teachers in the school, and then also very good. Uh, so um, kind of other uh, partners that he had. And so we had a very good, I mean, as I said, a very solid uh, business plan that was not used, uh, was not uh, traditional, I would say in Spain a few years ago. And, um, and then it's like he is when he just took the, the role of uh, CEO. And just to tell you how we first started the two of us, but uh, almost like right away. So we had to assemble uh, people. The names are not important, but so the capacities is what we had to look for, okay? Capacities in terms of um, project management, financial control. So there's they, very fancy the names that the, the, the tip titles that people have in companies that people take care of finances of business and then uh, starting to, to plan um, for the companies, uh, lab manager, project manager, and then of course various uh, board members and uh, that you have to and you need. So this is how we started and how were the few years, first year. So I'm showing you here. So as I mentioned, we started um, filing the patent, getting the, the paper, the paper by the way, so it was in, in cancer cell. At the same time, um, when just about the, the, the paper was published, so it's when we had the business plan and the licensing of the patent to then what was Biontech uh, Therapeutics. What how they had to we had to do a lot of things um, and and of course one thing is to to start talking and this was the European um, medicine agency so then basically two agencies was first in Europe and then in the US to start preparing preparing the, the dossier that you need to present uh, to get uh, then approval for for the, the clinical testing. 
and uh, you need various things. You need toxicity, the admetox, the administration, toxicity, um, the biodistribution. You have to show the half-life of your compound. You have to show that you don't have toxicities. A lot of work. And also, very important that when we talked about compounds, you need good manufacturer practice and, and good laboratory practices. And that also is something that you have to take into account. And this was how we got our first the 110 bile that we're very, very happy at the time we got this. And then, um, so what was my role? Okay, and, and my role, so as I mentioned, so from the lab, so on the one hand, so is data generation, then we had initially, uh, so the first experiments that uh, they were done um, initially by the company, then it was a CRO, it's a contract research organization, and I will talk about this later. And there really was a lot of uh, grant writing. And it was writing, so now you have different options. By the way, now with the uh, new funding from the EU, the resilience and uh, all these plans, so the opportunities for collaborations with companies, the opportunities for um, so kind of testing of uh, your proof of concept of your compounds. So that was the equivalent I, I was doing at the time. So the writing and, and basically talking with the uh, early investors. And early investors are very, were very different from the investors that we have right now. So the early ones want to know you, want to know at least we're friends of friends and, and um, we can talk about that if you want. So we decided not to go with a large uh, venture capital at the beginning because they were too aggressive. So we started small and we controlled a lot of the company. Um, and, and that was uh, in training, so new people. And, and then this was my, my role at the beginning. Then I continue with the, the company then. Um, so, well, so basically learning as they, they went, but the more and more and more advanced they went, so the more separated I got. And, and the reason is because when the company started, and I'm going to get you into the, the green, uh, so thinking about uh, clinical trials, so it was necessary um, expertise. And, and then we hired, and this was the new management team, it was Marisol Quintero, which is the current CEO. Marisol Quintero was at the time, was a person uh, with a lot of experience in um, investment, intellectual property. And uh, so she was handling in part uh, the tech transfer office at the CNIO, and she liked our company and she went for it. And very briefly, so uh, she was then things that you need uh, for the company, all the preclinical dossiers I talked, uh, the PK, the administration, toxicity, and then pharmacological aspects of the compound. Then uh, the patent filing, of course, these are different rounds of investments that you did till we got the green light for uh, the first clinical trial. And I can tell you how happy I was. And, and for a person, I mean, I'm a basic still of a researcher, but seeing that the company that I have started now, the company has its own life, of course. So this was very, um, a lot of satisfaction. Also, because it was at the time, it went in the news in Spain and, and abroad, because it was the first immune therapy, because the compound actually was very potent as an immune modulator in this form of cell death that it induces. And um, so I have to tell you that our compound was Bio 112, the com 10. The company then, uh, what it did is derive as a uh, derivative, improved, and then they have new patents. And now the compound in clinical trial is Bio 112. Okay. And um, so I'm not going to get into the, all the details, but this was uh, when it was presented, it was presented in ASCO, presented in ESMO. And um, so this is kind of a patient, the, 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 um, treat, the compound is now used for the treatment of very aggressive um, diseases, melanoma and other diseases that are resistant to immune therapy. And this is our angle, okay? So patients that did not respond to a, a standard immune checkpoint blockers, so they are tested in combination with our agent. And so this is as kind of a patient here, how the tumor was one of the first patients, see it was in 2018. And then after treatment, so the tumor uh, is kind of um, much more reduced. So that was also very happy for us. 
So now, um, just to, to tell you what it was after that. So several uh, clinical trials, um, phase one, which is toxicity, then the trademarks of MDO 112, as I mentioned, and now uh, phase two, what you do just now is uh, comparing uh, to um, just the single, so we, uh, to the, the treatments, a combination of the 112 with immune modulators, and then uh, the other branch you compare is the single agent, okay? And that's now the company highlight therapeutics. You can see the, the website and they have a lot, lot of information, but I'm gonna show you the, the uh, Michelle Quintero again because when I was talking to her and then one day she was so happy because you know, Marisol, we have now activity in different countries. We are no longer a startup. And then she said something that's very important. And I think Laura uh, shares some of this because this is her case as well with his com her company. And this project is part of my life. So we had the, the luck, I would say, of having a person that really took the compound as if it was hard, of course, and then really, really pushed because it was quite hard to, to get uh, to the clinical trials. So I have, um, so I'm gonna just take two more minutes to tell you um, what did we do um, in the in the meantime from the, the lab, you know? And in the lab, um, so should you see that one was the company doing the clinical trials and then us uh, working on the compounds. So one thing we generated the most model, I'm not gonna get into the details because this is not the, uh, the place, but basically we have mouse models um, they are uh, based on a reporter for a protein called beta 3 But the, the important point is that is the knockings that have GFP and luciferase when a process of metastasis start. And so um, our animals light up and they light up, as you see here, when uh, the metastatic process happens. And we call them meta-alert because the, the, this uh, lighting up of luciferase uh, happens very early on and allows us to, to follow the process of, of metastasis and then we discovered new mechanisms of metastasis. But then uh, these animals, we use them also for treatments, okay? And I'm gonna show you in a minute. So with these animals that you have here that we can study cells or patient-derived xenografts or genetically modified mice, we were looking for um, kind of mechanisms that favor metastatic process. Not to get into details, but we found a protein that is secreted is called midkine. And then we described the way that this protein acts to favor the expansion of the lymphatic vasculature on the one hand, and on the other hand, the motility of tumor cells and also intravasation, uh, extravasation of cells with the lymphatics. And then we found also new roles in the, in the context of immune therapy, okay? So this was with the mouse and what we discovered with these mice. But now, because we have tools to, to visualize uh, how metastatic processes happen. So now then we could look at our compound, BO110, and see what other effects it could have in the metastatic uh, process. And very interesting enough, so these you have animals that are quite sick. This is have a big tumor. And then what was into it, it just happened by luck, by chance, that one administration of this compound was able to completely abrogate this signal of metastasis in four doses, uh, to collapse. And this was very early on. So I told you before that we discovered the one time because it induced autophagy and, and apoptosis. So this effect was just a single dose. So this is the kind of the beauty, I would say, of having animal models where you can test compounds and can before, during, after the, the process of metastasis to try to find new mechanisms. And then uh, just to show you that we have animals that are immune deficient and immune competent, and then we test um, BO110 in there. Long story short, so we found with our models that we have uh, tumor cells that secrete the protein activate VEGFR3 lymphangiogenesis. And now with these mice, now we found that uh, these signals can be inhibited because BO110 can repress both midkine and VEGFR3. 
and not only that, it can activate um, a series of uh, immune um, cells and, and then with that, so favor the attack, the, the, the recognition and attack uh, of the tumor cells. And because of this uh, was also the possibility of combination with immune checkpoint uh, blockers. So um, this was us, the company I mentioned that was also in parallel doing the clinical trials. And I'm gonna show you this as the final slide, just to show you where we are or where they are. So first they started a phase uh, one um, in 1B, one uh, toxicity, then uh, phase two in combinations with uh, anti-PD-1, PD-L1. Now they are combination and then a partnership with different uh, companies. Here you have uh, some. You have also investigator um, uh, moved uh, assays. And one thing is very important I didn't mention. Um, both the, the activities of contract research organization, CRO, all the preclinical testing, even the testing in different models was, were done and the company decided to do so and we agreed to do so by, a different, by different labs. And this was a way to, um, for investors also to show their reproducibility and to make sure that this didn't depend only on the, in the founder's laboratory, okay? And, and that also gave, uh, you know, um, kind of impact to, to the company as well. And now indications for melanoma and for the uh, solid tumors where um, the, there is also resistance to immune checkpoint blocking. And with this, I finished and I can take uh, questions. So finished. So I told you, I'll show you our um, journey to, to try to translate our research. Uh, I told you that this hanging in, <laughs> so hanging there, but very, very important, the, the team. Okay, and I cannot stress enough, the team is what can save you, can sink you. <laughs> and uh, this is, in our case, we were quite lucky. And uh, this is the activity we have within the CNIO, you go to I can uh, highlight the objective. So thank you very much. And I can just take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Marisol. Uh, this has been great. Um, and I actually, yeah, a lot of the things that you said resonated with my story. <laughs> people get to, you know, each person has uh, his or her own path, but there are some things in, or some situations in which the paths touch each other. So you can recognize yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, and we can definitely learn from other people's experience. Uh, so this is what we hope to, to do with these webinars, uh, you know, teaching experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much for sharing yours. It's very valuable. While we wait for people to put uh, questions in the chat, uh, I will start with some of my questions. I'm sure that Mar has some as well. Yeah, but, I have uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. so I can't I, stop sharing. I, I, I was just wondering, for example, the, the choice of melanoma. No? So, uh, very often we hear that melanoma is actually not a very common disease. It's a rare disease uh, overall compared to other types of tumors. So that uh, when you started talking about uh, the market size or the market potential of this, uh, you didn't encounter, didn't you encounter some skepticism regarding the, the, the you know, this type of market because could it be reduced? Are there advantages or disadvantages uh, in going into a rare disease? Yes, so at the beginning, indeed, it was an advantage. Well, advantage. what was an advantage at the beginning was the fact that um, it was not an orphan disease, but almost. And indeed, uh, early on, so the first talks, uh, the first um, interactions with the, the European uh, agencies and, and the FDA, so they actually found it. So there was a, a very clear niche because it, so it is um, not the most frequent tumor, but it's frequent enough, it's, it's the melanoma is. So one out of 40 people would develop melanoma. And um, so there was the fact that they were not uh, responsive to radio therapy, so it was easier to speed up the process of uh, clinical testing. When I mentioned now, in the meantime, now there are, of course, a lot of uh, compounds. So it's not that, the, and the, indeed, now the market is bigger for us, 
because what we found that our agent, so is an immune modulator, so it can potentially uh, open up to different uh, tumor types. Now the, the niche, we have to find the niche, and the niche now is in patients that are resistant to or not responsive to immune th uh, therapy. So it's, it's potential. So in our case, no, no, we were, it was good and it still is uh, good because we have a, a clear path to, to, for treatment, yeah. I but mean, it's true that you have to readapt this exactly. because the moment you start having compounds being approved, you say, okay, well, where are we going to be in our niche? So the, the clinical trial was from the beginning had to be in combination because a single agent was clear that was not going to be sufficiently, not potent, probably potent, but it was easier for regulatory uh, purposes. And going to a more basic question and related with this question, how do you really calculate the market are you going to <laughs> no this is not as we said these the companies they do this they know the number of patients the number of years lost um the, so you calculate how much your compound is going to cost to produce how much the the market so your competitors are worth how much do they charge and then you estimate and then you have a number of years that you're going to be more competitive, then you're going to be less competitive and less, less. And all of these, they have formulas and values that they give you a number that is probably mm, an estimation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you are valued also how much they invest in you and how much you invest. So you have investments, your company values more if you don't have investors, even though your compound may be very good. That's also your line. And it's on several times you uh, added delay, delay, delay to your yes. uh, to your uh, slides. I was just wondering because this is a long term. So I wanted to know the strategy for your IP protection because the lifespan of the, of the first patent in the meantime is running, right? Yes. So what did you do in this case to protect your IP? Longer? So the company was very smart. Of course, this you have to keep in mind early on. So um, so we started with VIA 110. Now it's VIA 112. And the VIA 112 has another patent, has another, and so that uh, has also its own uh, extended uh, life. It's a different patent because it's a production, uh, is the way of packing. Um, yes, so that ensures, of course, that you are protected because you have uh, 10 years or 14 years, something like that. <laughs> Mark, did you have another question? You start again, no? With the pharmacokinetics, with the... Uh, well, uh, you start the, 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 the assay, the, the um, first assays were, or the clinical trials were with, it's BO110 and BO112, but was early on, so relatively similar, so they could speed that process. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, but you have to keep this in mind. Out of curiosity, you said that at the beginning you participated, for example, in the first conversation with VCs uh, to get mm -hmm. the company going. And now that the company has its own life, as you said, uh, do you still participate maybe as a key opinion leader? How do you participate? Uh, now? Well, the thing is that uh, the company is at a point right now that honestly, what I actually doing is learning and learning for the next uh, one if it happens. <laughs> um, I'm learning because there is just at the, at the decision point of uh, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria of patients. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also the decision of uh, marketing, uh, how to, to phase three. For, uh, this, this, at this point, I have to say, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a doctor. And I think there are people that are better trained than me. So what I have seen is that, because it was another company that started just when we started, and the, the, the original uh, founders, they interfered a lot. And they, they actually were a block for the company because the investors wanted to do something and they were like all the time negotiating, negotiating, no, yes. No. And so at, at some point you have to trust. And so at this moment, I have to trust because yeah. this is not in my capability. And so I'm better off doing, not interfering, <laughs> I would say. But I know that a lot of the different, as I say, it depends on how, um, your background is. If I had, I did not go to a master and did not do an MBA. That's why if I had more knowledge of that, I'd probably be more involved, but I'm not, so I'm fine. Yeah. And regarding the inclusion and exclusion criteria that you were 
uh, talking about. Uh, is there any possibility that, that you from your lab can help to, to, to research in which is this inclusion and exclusion criteria for, for, for patients? Or, or then you are mixing the, the company with the lab and this is not good? No, no, no. I, I never mix the company with the lab, I yeah. tell you. I'm not working with the 112. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's for a reason. I think there are certain things that are better to, to draw a line because if not, for example, thinking about grants, you might yeah. want to write a grant or application. And, and if you have your compound, it has a patent and you're limited, there are many things you cannot do. Yeah. Okay. Because, for example, uh, there are I know, Horizon 2020 or some projects that dealing with intellectual property, if I were working with the one time, it would be a lot more complicated to me in terms of freedom to, not, I always have freedom to, for research, but if you want to do combinations with other um, compounds or other things, we are better off with a, a basic... Uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Marisol, would you do this again? If you found another target, for example, or something else, uh, would you do this again? I would think about it a lot. Probably not myself. I don't see myself starting a company. Um, I think now they're better. So for example, let me have told her this person that started, he started several companies. How now he has a hedge fund. He has a um, company, there are companies that incubate your idea. Probably would go that way. Um, I would try to license as well, if you can get a good license. But um, we have a couple of compounds that might be that we pursue, but my, myself, myself, uh, very hard. You have to find the right person. Yeah. I, I also have another question regarding your beginning. Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, so when you created the company, when you constituted the company, did you constitute it with private uh, money, your own money, your savings? Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Did you do that? Yes, yes, yes. So when we went, so to register the company, and I don't remember how much it was, 5,000. I don't remember how it was the, the money. So it was our money. Then it's very typical that uh, investors ask the founders to put some money. And um, I did at the beginning also to not get too diluted. But then it gets to a point that I don't, I didn't, so I don't have many enough to, to invest at the level that these people do. So you just get diluted. <laughs> so that's why, uh, yes, that you have to negotiate at the beginning. So when there are several partners, what your role is. And then I got diluted for various reasons also to allow a way to get CEOs the way we have is also to share, um, so to, to um, transfer some of our shares. And this was also something that I did. You and mentioned that you helped with the writing of grants at the beginning. Uh, so did you go for public funding in parallel with private funding at the beginning? How did you do that? At the beginning, it was mostly, uh, so we had two sets. The public funding, um, yes, that would be the equivalent now to the proof of concept. It will be uh, the mind the gap, uh, like I it has. Uh, they are different. Uh, um, so then for the facet, you have also different opportunities. This will be the equivalent that we have. And then for the private uh, funding, so we talked to the, the investors, but this was the CEO who took care of. I can tell you at the beginning, and I think some was something that some of the venture capital was they were too aggressive, too, too aggressive. I mean, for a little money, they wanted like 90 or 60 per, 70 percent of the company. We said no, mm -hmm. the company said no. <laughs> and this is having business people in the company to make the decisions. I think that was important. And um, just to double check, do we have any question in the YouTube channel? Because otherwise, um... no, no, and if you want, we can. Uh, uh, it's more or less one hour. We can close the session if you want. And thank you, uh, my soul, for your fantastic talk. Okay. We have learned a lot about the process. I have many questions for you. <laughs> sure, we got. So you have my email, so just drop me an email or call. I'll be really glad to, okay. to answer. Okay. And thank you, Laura, also for organizing this webinar. That is a fantastic uh, uh, manner to initiate your 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 group. Uh, so good luck eh, with this. Yeah. <laughs>
So I, I joined Mar and uh, thank you, Marisol. Uh, this has been a great start uh, to our group's webinars. So thank you, Marisol. You set the bar very high. So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. <laughs>